So tell me, what was one of your favorite stories reporting in San Francisco in 2011? Um, I So I grew up in San Francisco. I'm a townie, sixth generation on my dad's side. And I um, started at the Chronicle as an intern, which was like always the dream. And basically how it would work is I would um, get into the office on Monday morning and my editor would be like, okay, tell me what you did this weekend. And I'd be like, well, like I did this, I did this. She'd be like, okay, that's a story. Okay, that's also a story. And, I, and one time I told her I, I went to Frat Mason. And she was like, a what? And I was like, Frat Mason, I don't know. Just hanging out having beers at Frat Mason. Anyway, so my first like tech culture story, or one of my first tech culture stories is about Frat Mason, which was like a neighborhood in San Francisco that it, Fort Mason is how it's also referred to. <laughs> and um, it's a just it's a one of these like classic San Francisco stories where it's a place that has all sorts of history and interesting depth and has sort of been taken over by a group of young guys who um, have set up like cornhole and and um, beer pong and and it's actually really fun but it's also goofy so I, I went and spent like a couple of days at frat mason for work yeah and Nellie was also telling me about that she loves covering tech bros and so <laughs> so so tell me tell me why <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna walk out <laughs> um i like I write stories that sometimes um, make a little fun or like uh, embrace sometimes the <laughs> a little <laughs> <laughs> that embrace the humor of what's happening here right now. But fundamentally, I, the reason I am here and am devoting my life to this storyline is because I think it's the most interesting and important storyline happening in America. Like I, I think I, I can get like super heady on this, but I think it is. Like when historians look back on 2019, yes, there's a lot of various things happening in DC and this and that, but what is being built in Silicon Valley and what is being built here is, is what's gonna reshape the, I mean, it's reshaping the world order. It, it, yeah, so I think what we're covering is both funny and the most important. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So Nelly. Yeah, let me stop rambling. Erin, what about <laughs> you? No, 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 what no. about you? So Nelly came to the Times in, just 2018, last I, year. I, Aaron came to the I Times. I mean, no, no, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so I joined Aaron, last year. Yeah. Um, but I started covering tech in around 2010, 2011, after covering private equity and finance for a number of years during the financial crisis. Um, I, I kind of realized, I emerged from, from that mess, um, noticing that power was really shifting uh, over to the West Coast, and uh, the companies that were rising up, um, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, were much more interesting than leveraged loans. And the people who were building them were getting very rich and getting a lot of power and um, reshaping business. And so that's when I first started uh, covering this industry. But yeah, now I just joined the Times one year ago, and I moved to San Francisco as part of that. So. And tell me what was one of your first favorite stories. So, well, so my first San Francisco story for the Times was about scooters, um, which felt really appropriate. Um, it was at right when I uh, joined was when San Francisco announced that they were letting two scooter companies operate in the city, and neither of them were the ones that had dropped off their scooters overnight without asking permission. It was the two that had gone through the proper channels, and it was like a real message that the city of San Francisco was sending to startups, which is that like the Uber playbook, the Airbnb playbook of ask uh, ask forgiveness, not permission is, is done here. <laughs> and uh, so that was a good initiation into covering startups in this city. And I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously we can talk about today's tech boom and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about today's tech boom, but I also wanted to compare it to the tech boom of the 90s. Well, actually even before we get there, what, like, I think the big question is, are we in a bubble? And I know anything that we say is speculative, but kind of based on... You want stock tips? I got stock your, tips. Yeah, based on, <laughs> based on your reporting, like, what would you say about that? Are we in a bubble? Well, this is a question that has been asked. I mean, this boom has been going on basically since the, the beginning, uh, or the 2009, essentially. That's when Uber and Airbnb were founded in the, in the depths of the recession. And the tech industry has been just sort of on, a, on an uphill swing ever since then. And I think around two, 
2012, maybe 2014, when the, when this unicorn narrative began to emerge, that's when everyone started freaking out and asking, are we in a bubble? And I can remember some venture capital firms even created t-shirts that said, this time it's different. Because that narrative was, you know, they were just every single panel, every single interview was like, are we in a tech bubble? And there were people, there were big time investors, Mark Andreessen and Bill Gurley were out there being like, this is a bubble and we're all in trouble and the startups are gonna vaporize overnight. and it didn't happen. It, stuff, it just kept getting crazier. The rounds kept getting bigger. The valuations kept getting higher. And you know, we got to the point where we are today where Uber goes public for $80 billion. So after a certain point, if you're screaming that we're in a tech bubble and it's not happening, you kind of just have to stop saying that. And th that's kind of where we are now is that like the warnings have stopped. The people who were warning that we were in a tech bubble are done. They're just throwing their hands up like, I don't know, it just keeps getting crazier and I've been wrong for four years. So, and, But to me, that strikes me as the moment that we probably should be worried. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of things that could that could end this this run, um, but most of the I'm not an expert. I can't predict the future. Most of the smart people that I talk to seem to think that the only thing that could stop uh, the tech industries, especially in startups and venture, like rise, is some catastrophic, unexpected event like you know some kind of crazy thing with a trade war or an actual war or like uh, you know uh, uh, some kind of act of God, basically. Or just like the broader stock market, which has been. Perhaps, yeah. If, if, yeah, it's hard to predict. But so, I guess my answer is probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was looking at um, the Times had done some reporting on the differences between today's boom and the boom of the, of the late '90s, and I mean, it was just really interesting to see that companies. You and I were talking about this earlier. That companies were staying private. Are, are, st are staying private for much longer today than they were in the 90s. I think the average was three years they were staying private before going public, and now it's something along the order of 10 to 11 years. And that's been used as a justification for why we're not in a bubble. It's like, oh, well, those companies in, in the in the dot-com bubble, like those companies were going public, they had no revenue, and they were losing tens of millions of dollars, and it was, you know, th they were letting, you know, retail mom-and-pop investors buy their stocks, and this is much better because we've got institutional investors who are experts or know what they're doing. They're the ones whose money is at risk, and these companies are getting to billion-dollar valuations before they go public, so they're de-risked when they go public. Um, I think maybe it, the fact that they're staying private longer means that they're able to wait longer to figure out if their business models are even viable. Um, and the, the, the influx of private money into these companies is maybe propping up some <laughs> businesses that aren't viable, but um, that, is one, that is one difference. Now, we all know that one of the big pain points, um, I think, to the tech boom is housing here in San Francisco. And so I just wanted to get a sense, just because I'm not from San Francisco, how bad is the problem? How bad is it, guys? <laughs> OK, it's not that bad. As, it's someone, fine. as it's someone who, yeah, as someone who just I moved here last year. I was like, I don't year. have to explain it, right? Like, we don't have to explain it, but. Um, We're getting our pitchforks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, 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 I mean, what is, I, I, Nelly, I read a story of yours recently where you were talking about kind of dorm living. So like people are trying to come up with, with ways to figure out how to get around this problem. Um, are there solutions? Build more housing. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. It, it, one possible solution is to build more housing. Um, <laughs> just, I, I, I was actually, before we did this, I was going back through some of the research that you had sent along, and that narrative has been go repeated for the last, like, decade. Like, every story, it, it has not changed. Yeah, the, the extent of, sorry, I probably haven't been holding this close enough. The extent of nostalgia in this city, it cannot be overstated. Like, the, 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 fear of changing anything physically. So I think that's been been a, a, a real problem, real challenge for the city in terms of like how then to deal with the fact, deal with the fact uh, of a huge economic boom of tons of people coming from all over the world who want housing and ha found jobs. And I mean, a thing that for most other cities would be like incredible and would be, and they want, it has been for San Franciscans a real tragedy because it's, by not building housing, we've meant a, a, a economic boom has been a tragedy for the residents of the community. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it's created this very strange paradox here. Right. Yeah, no, there was, um, I mean, an, ed an editor today was saying he thought that the start of it was Google, when Google started the private buses long ago, and that that, you know, then every company started following on, and then that, so then it allowed all these people to come to San Francisco and live in San Francisco. Well, and it's like an endlessly tricky thing, but so the private buses, so what do you want? Do you want the Googlers to be driving cars? Like, no, them on a bus is better. Or, okay, then do you want the Googlers to live close to Google? Well, Google actually wants that too, but the town around it doesn't want that. So they block housing endlessly. And so if you're 23 and you need to find a room to sleep in because you just got a job at Google, you have very few options. So people were protesting the buses, which became the symbol of of all that was bad about tech. And, and you, it made sense because they were big and beautiful and clean and white and scary and looked like alien vehicles, right? And they would take up normal bus stops. So like, I'd be in a bus and all of a sudden this like tech bus would zoom in in front. And it just, you know, but, but it was a not little great bit, optics. Not, not great optics, it just became like this really interesting symbol for the city. And I think it still is. Um, it's always surprising to me the way that the tech industry doesn't see those things coming. That is, I think, the one thing that has like surprised me about like when they you do something and you're like, oh, but you realize how that's gonna look, right? And they're kind of like, hmm. Well, yeah, but they're like they're in their like walled garden in Mountain View. And Can they, we actually just get a show of hands of how many people in, that are here work in the tech industry before we really like? Oh <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. You guys all take a Google bus here together? Yeah. Or like, <laughs> um, yeah. We realize if, that we're gonna be like, yeah, you know, you guys know all this stuff. I don't need to tell you about the Google bus. Yeah. <laughs> but as, so, so Nelly, as a longtime kind of San Francisco person, how do you, I mean, I can imagine you must feel conflicted at, at times, right? I mean, you've seen your city change so much and you're also covering it. Do you have a love-hate relationship with the tech industry? I, I probably fall on the side of, um, probably on the side of I'm into it. I think, it that, I think that the shame has been that the city didn't know how to respond to it well. Mm -hmm. And so it made a tragedy that didn't need to be a tragedy. Mm. Um, and, and I, but it's exciting, it's great. When I grew up in San Francisco, it was a little, I mean, it wasn't a little town, but it felt like more of a little town and tourism was the biggest industry. I mean, hospitality still is our biggest industry, but, but <laughs> tourism was huge and there, there wasn't, I, I wouldn't have stayed in the San Francisco I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the question? The, the tragedy is that an amazing economic boom, tons of jobs, has not translated for the residents of a city into a, a better life. And that's very strange. And that's not how markets normally should work. But it's not that the boom made a bunch of jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Can't hate it till you love it. I agree. Right? It was the suburbs. Because I, I, I raised agree. I raised my You're daughters right. in Palo Alto. I was right there. Yes. I and, also and blame you kept on Palo Alto. Pushing people out. You kept pushing people out, right? Yeah. So that's what happened. Let's 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 hold the folks we are electing accountable. Let's elect people who are accountable. And let's really have those discussions. Because my story is not being told. Okay, my mother, I still go to the house I was raised in, which is right behind San Francisco City College. I have neighbors who come up to me and ask me, 
did you say this and this and that? Because I've been here for 20 years. I said, well, if you want to qualify, let's qualify. I've been here for 58. <laughs> you know, so, so who are you to tell me what I should do in a neighborhood that I grew up in? That's what irritates me. Thank you. Yeah, yes. opening it up. Let's yeah. do it, guys. <laughs> Let's get into it. Yeah, you right here. I'm a teacher in San Francisco, and um, I've been. I moved here to go to grad school so I could become a teacher. Um, for the first ten years of my teaching career, I worked in tech. I made two thirds of my money in tech, and one third of my money in education but two-thirds of my time was in technology. I mean, excuse me, in education, and one-third of it was in tech. So I worked in the summers and in spring breaks and on the weekends in tech so that I could support myself as a teacher. At some point, I got um, uh, recruited to be a creative director at a startup, and they offered me four times the salary I made as a teacher. And I thought, then I had no retirement at that point, nothing, and I thought, Maybe I should do this. And so I did it for about 14 months, and it almost killed me. Um, I cried when I left my students. And I realized that what I really was was a teacher, and that working in technology was a way of supporting my educational career. So then I went back into education. Um, this was following the dot-com bust. And um, I've been working in education since. But now, as a person who's been working in education for 20 years, I feel like I'm being driven out of this city because I'm, I, I actually profit from the uh, kindness of strangers, basically. You know, I'm in a rent-controlled apartment owned by a woman that is 80-something, and if she dies, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, this is, I mean, so many of us are in these kind of tenuous... And part of my feeling is that I feel like I've contributed my entire adult life to the city of San Francisco, and not for the profit of San Francisco, but for the community of San Francisco. But I feel like it hasn't been, the favor hasn't been returned. Yeah. And I wasn't doing it for profit, I was doing it out of a belief in education and educating the children of San Francisco. Totally. Yeah. But things have really changed, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that whole, like, In reading, in you know, obviously coming out here, and I'm from New York, so I, you know, I have such a different lens. But coming out here and reading a lot of the coverage, seeing this tension between tech and the community, um, you know, and, and that's kind of manifested in some of the story. I mean, like the, the story that I was reading, you know, the, the corporate cafeterias, <laughs> and how the corporate cafeterias of, of a lot of the tech companies were taking business away from local restaurants. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, how are you finding that tension in your coverage? Like, how do you find those threads to, to pull at? It's probably more of a question for you. <laughs> well, I think when, when you're here, it's, it would be hard to miss the tension. It would be hard not to see it. I mean, yeah, so it's just... It's everywhere. The, the lunch thing was really interesting. But, but you guys how did you get to that story? How, well, how did that? Oh, because they were trying to ban cafeterias. So I was like, well. <laughs> do, you, do you guys want to hear about that? Or do you want to hear more about IPO stuff? Are you into the lunch thing? <laughs> you know about the lunch thing. Yeah. You guys <laughs> like the lunch? OK. Well, the lunch thing's interesting because it um, was, it, you know, in mid-market, part of the reason why they gave the tax breaks was because they thought that these companies would come and revitalize the whole neighborhoods, right? And that is a normal idea. But what? was mistaken was that a lot of these companies serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner to their employees in the office. And so restaurants that sprung up and that opened, you know, high-end restaurants for these folks ended up closing a few months later, a year later, whatever. And so kind of the neighborhood didn't have the neighborhood revitalization or sort of like there wasn't a lot of stuff that walking along the street you would run into and feel like you're in a lively neighborhood because the liveliness was inside Twitter or inside Square. And and that's happened at a lot of these tech companies. They become walled gardens. And so with San Francisco, there's a bunch of the supervisors got together and they wanted to um, ban tech cafeterias to force people to go out and have lunch. And you can understand on a social engineering point, like it, that makes sense, but obviously it, it um, is 
kind of overreaching for did that every, actually end up yeah, yeah no it didn't so it, it didn't work but it was a very like symbolic gesture and and it got a lot of people really frustrated and it was gave me a good chance to just walk along market street and ask folks how it felt to have a restaurant and how they were struggling to compete if you're running a indian restaurant a couple a block away from square how it's hard to compete against free lunch right right right. it sounded like it was like a dead zone for them people who were right next to twitter who were you know who had a business just it was a total dead zone yeah it's 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 been really confusing and frustrating for the local business owners yeah and i mean you can probably tie a direct line from that to the now quote unquote ipo tax that is being talked about that may or may not end up passing but it's basically i mean it's a tax on income on stock as income but it's being called the IPO tax because it taps into this like anger over the idea that like all these people are suddenly getting rich and it's being marketed that way even though it's not really like an, maybe an accurate yeah word it's a for return it, to what the tax level was in 2011 before right. they did a break but it just kind of i think it just like sort of paints the picture though of like what is politically viable right now um, is like you know rage <laughs> yeah i mean i, I i'm just wondering I mean, the easiest way, right, that a business gives back to a community is through tax revenue. So, like, have there been, I mean, this IPO tax, like, where is this state of it? It's, it's not yet. Um, I don't think it's, yeah, I think it's unlikely to, or uh, what is the latest on that? I actually have I don't know. I went to the lately, announcement. Yeah. Um, they announced it. I don't know what the next. Yeah, there's support for it, but I don't know law. where it's going to. The problem is that they're, they're going to try. The problem is they're going to try to do it retroactively for some of the companies that have already gone public, and that is extremely tricky and probably unlikely to actually work out. Right, right. And also, like, who has power in that in that relationship? Because oftentimes companies are also asking for tax breaks and tax deals, and you know. And so I'm wondering because there was that Twitter. The reason that Twitter and Twitter is where their headquarters is, where it is, is because they were offered a tax break, and that's like the problem with the cafeterias. They were they were offered that tax break in the hopes that they would then revitalize th that area, but they haven't. So, are there stories of of companies giving back? Like, do we have? <laughs> I mean, they're never gonna do it in the way that it will satisfy their critics. So they can try and they you know can do a lot of PR around it, but like that's yeah. Have you seen our fancy new skyscraper? Right. I was gonna make. A Dallas joke. <laughs> yeah, Our fancy new raised up park that we can't walk on. Yeah. Um, no, of course these companies give back. Like, uh, and, and uh, like, it's undeniable that the city has gotten nicer. Like the parks are nicer, the things are nicer. Like it, so it's not like they're like bad or evil or, I don't know. That's, I, I fall in the middle of it, but you guys can like fight among each other and. <laughs> I see some people shaking their heads. <laughs> <laughs> <A lot of> <laughs> um, this person right here. And I'm very grateful for that um, because it gives me a lot of energy and sucks a lot of energy. It's both and like pro and minus. Um, but this is exactly the point. So um, we were also talking about community. And um, I think the main problem is, for, or let's say when you were talking about saying, oh, yeah, we need to build more houses. I was always thinking, where should they build them? Where do they um, build the houses? I don't know where. Um, and that could actually destroy here and there um, the community. Like I live in Ingleside Terraces, which is a, um, one single family house with detached, very beautiful. And I cannot imagine that would be great for a lot of uh, skyscrapers and thousands of buildings, but that will destroy the beauty and the uh, um, um, the beauty of the city, I think. So it is a pro and con, like, um, yes, of course, we have to deal with um, the people who are want to come into the city. Um, but on the other hand, we are not, we, we should not destroy the city by saying, oh, we have to build and build and, dis and yeah, do something different. Um, that's how I see, uh, see it. And um, I think the we should not always point on the boo, boo, boo um, tech industry. Um, because, you know, I think they give back, as you said, you know, they try to do their part as well in a certain way. 
maybe everybody of us sees it in a certain, they think, oh yes, well they should do it in this way or in that way. Everybody has their opinion, but they, I think it reached them at a certain point. And I was really happy when I was reading two days ago um, from the New York Times that um, Thank Hawaii, you. I think, mm. Hawaii, I think um, they were posting that Hawaii, uh, that Google, or yeah, I think Google was, um, and other big companies were forced not to um, sell anything to Hawaii again. Huawei or how Huawei. Huawei. Yeah. Huawei. Huawei. Um, and they still do it. This is power, guys. This is power. They're saying, no, wait a second. Um, we can't do that, you know? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. Oh, that is again, you. and the, co the politicians are saying, oops, what can we do against it? So I'm, that is yeah. also one point. How about, yeah. Hey. Uh, wait, let me uh, give you the phone. Cool. Thanks. So, so I, 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 I've been here for over 25 years. And so I survived the tech boom and bust, and the other tech boom and bust, and then the other tech boom and bust. <laughs> um, and like you, I remember this as kind of a provincial town, right? And I feel like we have moved to a world-class city now, and that technology is here to stay. And what we're trying to adjust to is the fact that it is here to stay, and we have to make it work now. Yes, yes, know, yes. So, yes. you know, New York is, is finance and media. We are now tech. And so we have to, we have to find a way to balance these things and not try to, try to suppress technology companies. They're here to stay. Now, in the, in the, in the dot-com bust, everyone left right after the dot-com bust. And so I think the fear is there's going to be another bust and everyone's going to leave again. And so the question of whether there is a bubble here, I think, is a big question. And I don't think that's going I don't think technology is going away, but that's just my opinion. Well, worst case scenario, they leave and we have the Trans Bay Terminal. It's nice. <laughs> we get to keep it. <laughs> to that point, one thing that, that I've noticed that's interesting in the last couple of years is that the tech companies themselves, particularly the smaller startups, are actually having a really hard time surviving here. It's hard for them to compete against Google, Facebook, and Apple to hire. It's hard for them to, you know, like find housing for their employees here. And so a lot of companies um, are very quickly in the beginning opening second offices in Denver or Phoenix or LA or somewhere else. And some of them are even starting with their executive team here and fully remote from the beginning. And so I, I found that like they, they might start leaving or like trickling out into the rest of the country without a bust um, because it is so competitive here. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. There are a lot of cities in the US that would love to have a booming tech economy and are like eagerly welcoming those companies in. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a trend that's really accelerated in the last couple of years especially, and I don't think it's a bad thing. But luckily the venture capitalists, um, are, no offense if any are here, are lazy and they don't like to get on planes, and so they'll always be here. <laughs> Okay, the only counter to the idea that Silicon Valley can be spread, or that San Francisco can be spread out across the country, is that um, it, there is something to be said for the geographic closeness and tightness of it. And there's a mm -hmm. reason why we haven't seen another Silicon Valley burst up. And I've covered the other innovation zones, and I mm -hmm. wanted it to work, but they haven't. And I think part of it is, if you work at a startup and your startup fails, you can get another job really easily without having to change your life. It's not a big deal. Yeah, you culturally, just there's no stigma to yeah. the failure here. And that also, like, you don't have to worry about your lease because you're in the same part. It, just logistically, I get why it's been so consolidated. And it took me a while to, like, really... Because I was like, why... It, everything's remote. Everything's on email. Why do they... But they... Yeah, no, it's, it's been... going to spread. It's been a slow, a slow burn, but I do feel like it has accelerated in the last yeah. couple years. Yeah, what's your theory? When you have diversity of thought, I mean, when when you take a place like, and I don't want to say Denver's homogenous, but a more homogenous. <laughs> you can say that. It, it, it's a safe space. <laughs> and I, I speak to not necessarily my own experience, but the experience of others who have had to work with other offices outside of Silicon Valley, and they see that the teams are not as diverse in their thought process, 
they do, they do not necessarily bring the same kind of um, out of the box ideas as here. And I don't mean to say that, you know, or to dismiss that other areas cannot provide that, but it's there just is that something to be said about how, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just I think it's about the fact that in a mindset that we have, we are more receptive to open, to, yeah. to just being open and honest and bring out any and all ideas, regardless of how crazy they may seem. Because look, look at Elon, right? <laughs> and he has so okay, that's maybe too crazy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but I, that, that's my theory. Yeah. One, I mean, one of many reasons why. No, I love why. that theory. So. Let's, um, okay. Yeah, let's go in back. I don't know, Aaron, you point to something. Right there. Right there. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. The, the topic at hand. The like to hear about IPOs? Yeah, let's do more. I do do people have questions related to the IPO discussion? IPO Palooza? Okay. Hi, I'm gonna out myself. I work at Slack. <laughs> so Congrats. Uh, I wish it was as you know great for me as it was for Stuart Butterfield. Um, I have a question about how the IPO can impact like this city. I think I'm Young, I moved here in 2015 specifically for the job opportunities, and I was attracted to Slack specifically because I knew that they were going to go public, and I wanted something like that. Um, I have a lot of guilt about being the problem. I like read a lot of like what's going on in the city, and I feel shitty about it, and I feel like I want to do more. Have you talked to anyone in your reporting that actually has like actionable solutions that people who work in the industry can do because um, I would be really interested, but I haven't really found anything other than like volunteering at my local homeless shelter or like anything like that. Um, just curious to hear your thoughts. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> that was not yes. meant to be funny. I mean, yeah. There. Well, there's like a lot of forms of philanthropy. That's not an area that I cover, but there are a lot of um, <laughs> tech billionaires that are donating money in their various chosen ways. Um, so there's that. You can give your money away. You can volunteer. Um, <laughs> you can organize company volunteer things. I'm like way out of my depth here because I cover <laughs> finance. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I'm just wondering the other the other thing about I think the tech IPOs that, you know, I've seen is in terms of the coverage, right? We're, we're creating Many, many, I think there was a number that we 5, saw. 5,000 millionaires. 5,000? Five, yes. For th th expected, th estimated 5,000 millionaires created this year with the IPOs. Wow. Um, and that's um, of about like $100 billion of expected funding raised through the IPOs this year. Wow. Yeah. And I think that there was another number that was cited somewhere about how one out of 11,000 people here is a... Billionaire. <laughs> billionaire? Or yeah, a I mean, it's hard to wrap your mind around <laughs> what that exactly means because I don't know 11,000 people, so it's right. not like I. <laughs> right, 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 right. Is that a small amount? Is that a little amount? But I do think that San Francisco is clearly like a microcosm of a larger national problem, which is this kind of income inequality problem that we've been talking nationally. Like, and, and I'm just wondering, like, both of you have, have you investigated kind of income inequality here in the, in the city? And, and, and how like ha ha the efforts to combat it? I mean, I think that with the IPOs, and just to go back to your question, like you shouldn't feel bad for being an ambitious young person who came here to make their living. Like that shouldn't be punished or stigmatized. I, I think that there is an enormous um, fear. The, it, we already see the inequality here so viscerally every day when you walk on the streets and you, you you cannot ignore inequality here. I think inequality is an American problem in every city. It's uh, ha it's happening and it's growing all around the country, but here we feel it immediately. Um, so yeah, there's a real fear that the IPOs, that 5,000 new millionaires, that very few housing units are sold every year, that, that this is all going to just get more intense and that the, instead of the bust that everyone was promised a few years ago, instead, there's just more boom. And so it's like, it's a little bit of feeling of exhaustion, a little bit a feeling of fear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the yeah. conversation about kind of universal- you know, We think about inequality all the time. 
the conversation about universal basic income, I feel like, is happening more actively here on the West Coast than on the East Coast. Um, and I'm wondering if that's a result of kind of the millionaire totally. flood. Yeah, because uh, it's guilt. <laughs> it's guilt, and it's also Silicon Valley people thinking that there's going to be like a quick, easy fix to a problem, and also a quick, easy fix that has nothing to do with the established government system already. Like that can't be the solution. It must be like this other techno random techno solution. Um, so yeah, universal basic income is really trendy right now. You're raising your hand a lot. Are do you like study only if you study UBI or something? <laughs> no, you don't. No, no, no. The, um, but it's this idea that like inequality is going to be so bad and there's going to be a huge class of people who just don't have any jobs. And so um, the only solution for this like techno future that a lot of people in Silicon Valley think is relatively soon um, is to just give people money. And it's a pretty like somewhat popular idea. Um, yeah, people like it. Are there, there <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, but but the uh, the Sam Altman banked experiment oh, has has been a not um, yeah, a huge. Tell me about that. What's success? I mean, I I haven't like actually covered that, but I don't think they got a lot of participants for it. There are other studies and examples of this happening. Actually, and there's like a one long term one that happened in, with the Native American community that actually showed that long term it it did help pull people out of poverty and it like you know got them ahead in life. And so it there are is a lot of value there's a lot to be said to about it but maybe future, not the way Sam Altman's doing it yeah if the future that these companies or that these venture capitalists see happens like then radical new solutions to inequality are going to be what will be necessary to maintain a stable society I mean you can't you, you don't want San Francisco to turn into Johannesburg where we have like uh, the haves have to have electric fences and security guards. And I think that there's a real fear about that. Like I, I'm working on a story now, don't tell anyone, on, on <laughs> like private security on the rise in the city. I've been working on it for like six months, so it's like, um, but like people hiring more private security and home security and all that. And then, you know, a lot of things that you start to see in radically unequal societies. Have you talked to Kim Kardashian's private firefighter? <laughs> That seems like your first call. <laughs> That's a really good point. Thanks as your signing editor. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, OK. <laughs> Great. Um, so I really dig what your guys' beat is. And I'm wondering if you guys spend any time looking. For, I mean, there's a lot of genius going on in the tech industry. But I feel like we're missing the genius piece of how to take the success of a company that moves in here that grows, that has, develops a lot of wealth, and make sure that what they're doing also includes how to improve the community around them. Like you can build a Salesforce tower and what's the amenity that the rest of the city gets from that? I'm uh, not sure that there is any, but shouldn't there be? Are there not, don't we need some geniuses to figure out how to take our capitalist approach here and turn it in such a way that when they're building their, you know, monstrous buildings and their great success, that there is some way to take all of the rest of what's around them into consideration as the whole. Are there geniuses around here that are are motivated to think that way and, and help us out of this? I mean, I actually have seen some evidence of that in the last couple of years. I think for the first time, a lot of people in the tech industry, after the 2016 election, and they saw sort of like the Russian meddling, and they they sort of started looking around and asking, like, wait, what are we building here? Why am I working on this? I've, I don't think this is a universal, I can't generalize, but I've seen a lot, I've talked to a lot more people who have said, oh, I don't want to be working on an ad targeting or privacy invading thing. I want to take the money that I've earned from Facebook or wherever and start something that maybe can actually make a real difference in the world. And like, I've seen a lot of interesting social impact companies rise up, social impact funds doing this kind of investing. Like, long way to go, but like it, it actually has given me a little bit of hope that like, okay, it's not, the stereotype is true in some cases, but not all cases. And there's been um, a shift in thinking where it's like, let's not just do this because we can, let's like ask if we should and why, and, and you know, maybe not do it <laughs> if it's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. 
Well, Google did apparently have an ethics department, and then that guy left and became one of Google's biggest critics. Um, I don't know if they still have an ethics department or not, but that's also the media's job a little bit. And the Salesforce is a, is a company that doesn't have a corporate cafeteria, right? Yeah, they so actually. It is. They, so those employees do have to go into the streets and, and buy. Benioff's been lunch. very vocal they about have their giving back. They their one percent give back. They, kind of they, thing. He's been, and he, and he rags on the other CEOs for not giving back enough. And he's been a pretty um, vocal give back guy. <laughs> um, you with the beard and the and I like I like your pocket. <laughs> You were talking about Salesforce, and it reminded me of the cultural blindness and the genius melded into the same people. Uh, Salesforce helped build a beautiful park on top of the Transbay Terminal. Go into the Transbay Terminal and go look for a map to tell you how to get around the city with the buses that go through that terminal, and you will see one paper map on the wall, and that is it. There is no thing like Grand Central Terminal with a marvelous group of people to give you directions on how to go where and what buses to take and what transportation. Salesforce may be brilliant in terms of earning money, but they are culturally blind when it comes to actually providing the services that they actually fund to build. Mm -hmm. And they could have built beautiful high-tech computer-operated terminals yeah, there to give people direction, and they didn't do that. Mm. Thank you for that. Question? Go ahead. A little bit of a statement in a way. It seems like the, no, the no. main... <laughs> a lot of statements. <laughs> well, the main theme here is how is technology transforming communities? Yeah. Yeah. And in a way, there's, there's no big story here in that um, the Bay Area has very lim limited housing because of the geography. And it's, it's one of these things where you see um, or, uh, an expansion of Silicon Valley, in part because of uh, the rise of this platform type of economy where it's more of a winner-take-all. And, and so those platforms are often emerging here. Uh, even you mentioned uh, companies that if they, if they go and somebody's looking for a job somewhere, they can always find one because it's a startup. Um, that kind of leads to the second observation, which is a big, the big trend here is I think that people who depend on the re return on capital have been doing pretty well, but people who are reliant on the return on labor have seen diminished optimism. Yeah, people who take wages. Um, parts, I think there's three drivers for that. One is I think tech we're gonna, we have a lot of questions in the audience, right. so I think we're going to have to cut, but, but I, yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. no, I have. No. Um, you with the red shirt. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, so I'm thinking about um, the tensions, you know, that we're all thinking about between tech and the community in San Francisco. And I live in San Francisco. I also teach in San Francisco. I'm not in tech. I'm a pretty vocal critic of tech. Um, I live in the outer sunset. And I can just say anecdotally that on my block there, are, uh, most of the residents have lived there for a long time. And there are a few new residents who are venturing out, a few new you know, techies or Googlers or whatever, who are venturing out to the outer, outer sunset. And, uh, and those people don't participate in the community that exists on our block. You know, they don't tend to say hello or um, uh, hang out with us or um, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different way of kind of being in the neighborhood, you know, like, and there are these neighborhoods all over San Francisco, like small little enclaves. And uh, I think that a lot of the tension um, that exists comes from uh, like a kind of a 
maybe a userous attitude towards San Francisco. You know, when I was a kid, I lived on the peninsula and all of our fathers and some of our mothers commuted to San Francisco for jobs, but then commuted out of San Francisco for our homes. And now people commute to like the reverse commute has become the commute, yeah, which is very interesting to me. It's strange that and we've become a bedroom community. why is that, right? And I think it's people want to live in San Francisco because of the cultural amenities in the city, but the cultural amenities are people's neighborhoods and people's yeah. communities. They're not like playgrounds that can be used up or purchased. And so there's this tension between totally. kind of like the people who live here and have made San Francisco interesting or colorful or diverse or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then there are, you know, newcomers maybe with more money or more resources that want to participate in the in the cultural communities that have been built, um, but don't quite know how to enter. And I think, yeah. you know, just to answer your question, well, this person's on, you know, well, how, you know, how do we enter the community? I mean, I think it's just as simple as like being a good neighbor or being a good friend, like just like taking the time to participate in that community that already exists rather than seeing it as like a playground to be used or to be purchased. Mm -hmm. Talking to your neighbors yeah. <laughs> is a way to the give back. The New York back. Times supports that. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Did you want to say something in response to well, yeah. well, no, I think the one, the one thing that, just to tie it back to sort of the, the topic, is that one of the big differences now is that these IPOs, all of the companies that are going public and a lot of their employees are actually based in San Francisco versus like in the last... In the last boom, it was very diffuse all across the valley, and it feels a lot more intense now because it's very much concentrated here. So. I, and I also just wondered, like, you know, listening to your story, is just like how much also is generational, mm -hmm. and how much is also like people finding communities in their company as opposed to their neighborhood. You know, because like you know, you, Nelly, you were talking about the Waldorf Gardens. Is like how much are people finding community just by their talking to their colleagues? And given that we now are in this kind of 24/7 work environment, that your community is really just the people that you spend all day with. And your identity is your job. And yeah. Your work is your life, and yeah, that is a whole other plague that is um, <laughs> that is not just unique to San Francisco, but is very strong here. <laughs> And so it's like, you know, you're going to a place that is actually, that's considered your community. And when you come home, you're, it's almost just a place where you sleep. Mm -hmm. yeah, as a, as a opposed great to lie like that work is our family. Right. But we've all been told that, everyone in our yeah. generation. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering whether that's just a generational difference as opposed to a tech versus kind of community. We don't yeah. have, I mean, have I, neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> we just have cubicle mates or open right. office plan buddies. Right. And we will complain about our neighbors on next door. <laughs> you and then and then you. Go ahead. Just kidding, don't do that. Hey yeah. Um I'm also a San Francisco native and I feel like I'm a San Francisco defender often with <laughs> so much onslaught of this narrative anti tech. Um Help me make my case. Why is San Francisco still a great person for a young person that doesn't live in tech to move? Before I let Nellie make that case, <laughs> I would like to say that having just moved here yeah, one year ago, Aaron I, just I, moved was, here. I was so surprised by when everybody asked, oh, how's it going? How do you like San Francisco? And I'm like, it's great. I love it. And they're like, what? No one believes me. I found myself having to really like say, yes, like it's beautiful. I love my neighborhood. I love the Castro Theater. I love like this and that. And like there is a lot of like, I want to like it. I live here now. Um, there's a lot of things that are beautiful and amazing about it, but also it's flawed, just like New York where I came from, so. I think part of the reason why the narrative on San Francisco has gotten a little bit skewed is, and this is my like California bias, but I think part of it is that most, our media capital is in New York. All Most of the writers are in New York. The stories are being told from people who live in New York. They're looking at San Francisco and um, it, seems weird and foreign and strange and also um, they don't like that it's become so powerful. It's upsetting, it's disturbing on some like kind of emotional level. So I, I think part our of our bosses in New York will be watching this. Part right? of it is just the <laughs> haters me hate. <laughs> no, I, I um, what's my case for San Francisco? Go, go for a walk. I, uh, I, 
I'm, I've been dating this girl who I'm trying to convince to move to San Francisco, and uh, it's been a lot of walking around Land's End, <laughs> walk Chrissy Field. <laughs> we did Golden Gate Park. <laughs> <laughs> did you ride a trolley? No, I've, I've never actually been on one. <laughs> I know. Nellie. And Tosca? there was a question back there. Have you there? been to Tosca? <laughs> Hi, so you all mentioned the sort of generational component, and I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on some of that and the sort of institutional forces arrayed against that. How s sort of do you grapple with the fact that, like, I'm 24, it's going to take me, like, I've done the math on how long it would take to own a house, and I've heard people defend <laughs> their single-family houses and say, this is my neighborhood. I grew up in the Bay, too. I can't buy a house here. I can't, like, stick around here if I want that. And there's this anti-growth narrative and also the huge tax benefits that are given out through Prop 13 to an older generation. So how, like, this connected with the tech thing, like, could you please speak to that and sort of the generational component to this anti-growth discussion? I mean, I actually don't think that's necessarily unique to San Francisco. There's a, I mean, I, I feel like I log on to Twitter as a dutiful journalist every day, and I see this, like, generational war happening between, like, boomers and millennials and they're, they're stereotypes, but there's also a lot of like truth to some of the criticisms and um, it's it seems like it's only getting worse, unfortunately. Um, I don't have a good solution to that, but I, I do think that you're absolutely right that that, um, that tension is, is I bad. went. Um, that I is went definitely not just a San Francisco <laughs> problem. I mean, ha being someone in New York, you know, you think about like the people who, rode that real estate broom and are all kind of cashing out and benefiting and then the new generation of people coming to the city who can't afford i mean i agree it's and like student not loans social security yeah. there's, yeah, there's, there's like, like a whole bunch of you know like people who had pensions and pensions don't exist anymore i mean so yeah i agree and there are people like the i'm doing a story on the or t that touches a little bit on the yimby movement the yes in my backyard movement and i went to one of their Info sessions. That oh, Nellie, tell me, what is YIMBY? Like, what yes is in this My movement? Backyard is a, is a pro-development movement to build in San Francisco, to build more housing here. Um, the idea being that that will make San Francisco more affordable. And um, I went to their like intro to YIMBY meeting two nights ago, last night, God, I'm so old. And um, oh it felt a little bit, like the generational war aspect felt really real. It was a lot of young people at sitting in folding chairs while someone was giving a talk about like literally saying like here's another thing to be mad at your grandparents about <laughs> like, and then like don't forgive them for this and then yeah. and it and was really also, interesting on, on the flip side there's also like a powerful age discrimination that happens especially in the tech industry and like i hear stories all the time yeah. about that that are really like surprising and, and heartbreaking as well. There, it's Thinking about it as a generational war, though, for me, thinking about stories has been really useful and interesting. Like, reframing it that way um, is starting to become, like, on, in, from both ways, from, like, like a, it, yeah. H how big is the YIMBY movement? Like, have they made any progress? I'm going to get it wrong. Progress? I'm not, I'm, uh, Connor Doherty, it, you, you guys should read, our colleague Connor Doherty has been covering this, has a book about this movement coming out. Um, <laughs> He knows. <laughs> <laughs> Email Connor. Yeah. Uh, this question right here. Mm -hmm. I moved here 35 years ago as a 24 year old, and I knew then I would never be able to build a house. I don't or own a house. I think that's always been true here. I think the difference has been when I came, it was to do stand up comedy, and I have watched the city go from being embracing the arts, to being very patronizing about the arts, to now being hostile um, to uh, those of us who chose not to make money. I, I echo what the teachers are saying, who just wanted to embrace San Francisco in a real way. Um, and now it's an actual resentment. How dare you be poor and live here? Um, you know, as a typical, um, uh, uh, rent control person. I literally have a landlord who's trying to kill me because I'm now the old lady upstairs with the cat, and <laughs> he can get four thousand instead of one thousand. And and there actually isn't a housing crisis specifically. I know in my building they've left many units open 
because he won't rent unless he can get the $4,000. So I wanted to say I'm glad the young girl here feels a little bit guilty and is questioning how I can get back. No, no, only to say that. What a proxy for your whole no, generation. No, I'm no, very no. sorry. Or a Google only bus. Only to say that <laughs> it will make her realize, as the other woman said, that it starts with the individual. It starts with neighbors. The city has become have and have nots. I view the nots as neighbors on the street. I'm now about to turn 60. I spend my days just feeding the people in the alleys, which is not the vision I had um, of coming to San Francisco in the 80s. But I'm just saying, it, it, every tech person, you know, they don't get home till eight. So how can they go to the restaurants? How can they go to the theater? How can they go to the movies? They do just come home and sleep. And I think you hit it right on the head to say, um, it's more generational than tech, but those two things are completely tied together. And I also just wanted to say, I am thrilled that it's all women up there, that, <laughs> and that you've been articulating the stories. I use your stories, I get the times, and I cut out your stories every day to oh, send to so other amazing. friends to try and explain what I've been trying to articulate about what's happening That's to San amazing. Francisco. Thank you. So thank you. And we report to a female editor who reports to a female editor who reports to a female editor, so. Very um, nice. <laughs> <laughs> You're based out of New York, and I always felt like, God, they've got the essence of San Francisco right. So they got Nelly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, thank you for representing you us, uh, good or bad. What, but <laughs> what what a lovely crew. <laughs> best. The public yeah. the library is like always the best crew. <laughs> This agreed. Agreed. All right. Um, yeah, well, right here. <laughs> a few years back, or maybe. Oh yeah. Holy maybe Have you seen like Harry Potter in like a sorting hat? <laughs> <laughs> um, like five or six years ago, there was that story about the tech company that came to the Mission Playground and took over the yes. soccer field. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was an interesting story. But I'm also wondering, like. I'm hearing a lot about uh, small business owners that can't af can't keep people because even if they're paying above minimum wage, they can't af those people can't afford to live here, and no one's commuting in for like a minimum wage job. So what I'm curious about is where are those stories, and how are we telling as a society the I mean above there and beyond. There aren't enough of those stories. You're right. Yeah, mm -hmm. there needs to yeah. be more. And can my you just my can cousin has a bunch happen? of bakeries in the city, like Jane Cafe. <laughs> They're awesome, and um, she's always uh, telling me about how hard it and is to mission get pie, bakers. Like mission pie can't like all of those like historical businesses yeah. can't afford to keep people because they can't afford to live on minimum wage. We should cover it more. You're totally right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Are we? Out yeah, of time? Can yeah, we yeah. Let's yeah. Like, yeah. We have we have a, we have a time for maybe two more questions. But I'm actually curious. Yeah. How are stories approved? Like, wh what? <laughs> what is well, the? I uh, slip my editor a twenty, and I say. <laughs> what is? I mean, uh, you know, when uh, you when you pitch stories to editors, like, what what are are there ingredients criteria? I mean, I know that the daily we have kind of a criteria, but. I mean, it's uh, the our our most limited resources is our, the reporter's time, and so we are constantly having to balance what is going to have the most impact, um, what matters the most, um, and there's a lot of like crazy tech stories or like stories of tech companies doing wrong that I want to do but they they are so s they're not they're not big enough unfortunately and like I don't have time to do every single story and so it's constantly a matter of weighing like which one matters the most which one is has will have the most impact and which one like can shed light on something like that society cares about um, and so that is like kind of the challenge that I'm constantly facing is like, why would this matter? And th the funny thing about covering startups is that like I, the bar keeps getting higher and higher. Where like I'm covering, like I covered Slack's IPO, for example, um, and I covered Uber's IPO. But there are a lot of other big, crazy IPOs that have happened that my editor is just like, that's not big enough. We need to like only focus your time on the biggest ones. So it's a it's a real trade off. And then Nelly just writes about all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Two more questions. I, th I well, actually, maybe one more question. Sorry, I just saw the time. Um, who's okay? Uh, okay. Yes. Fine. Gray jacket or sorry, uh, tan jacket. First of all, I, I grew up in San Francisco. Also, where did Hill School marry? <laughs> Hamlin. I was a Pack Heights brat. Oh, I went to Stuart Hall in seventh and eighth grade. Uh, <laughs> and then I went to SI. 
Oh. I've lived, so I've lived in the Bay Area my entire life. My parents are Irish immigrants. Our family business is on Valencia Street, and so it goes. But um, David Talbot wrote uh, Season of the Witch, which is an amazing book that details how the city that I grew up in, that a lot of people here moved to, came to be in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, and the artists and the hippies and the gays and the immigrants and the firefighters and the lawyers. And like, it feels like that city is being dismantled right now. And there are amazing new things, like, and there are amazing things that will always be here, like the Golden Gate Bridge, woohoo! The Alamo Draft House, fantastic. The Giants Ballpark, great. And there's amazing things, and it, it's not just like, fuck the Google bus, even though I want to say that a lot, but that city that Talbot wrote about, that we all love, that this mystical thing that, that, that uh, the last black man in San Francisco is about, like, what does the tech industry does the tech industry have any responsibility to that city? Or is it just the people who live here scraping together to try to keep that intact? Or is it the city's government or the state of California? Like, do we care about that city? Or is it just like, ah, oh, there's the Haight-Ashbury and there's some hippie in a tie-dye t-shirt and like, that's a, it's a quaint thing. But do, like, do we care about doing other things in the city? Or is it just tech? Like my wife and I, we have a startup in San Francisco. It's a wood shop that we rent out space to and people in the Bayview district. Like, th that's a startup, that's a new business, and nobody cares. And like, we're creating jobs. But like, does the tech industry owe anything to that? Or is the tech industry just like doing its thing and that's great and everything will trickle down? Or is it like the responsibility of the mayor and the board of supervisors and the people of San Francisco to preserve that history? I mean, I think that's a fantastic question. It's it's one I've thought about a lot, but maybe never articulated quite that well. Um, and I think it's something that every individual has to kind of think about. There are probably a lot of people in the tech industry who are like, no, that's not our problem. We don't care about that. I'm here to do my tech thing. And there are probably a lot of people who are like, no, no, I love this too. I might not be contributing to it in the same way, but I want to be. And so I, I think it's totally an individual level, company level, investor level, whoever you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I just want to reintroduce our guests, Aaron Griffith, who covers startups and venture capital for the New York Times, Nellie Bowles, who covers tech and culture for the New York Times. And thank you so much. Subscribe you to the New York Times. Thank you for coming and for all your comments. <laughs>